Hello, and welcome to yet another edition of Loremaker's Guide to the Galaxy. I'm your host for today, senior writer Will Weisbaum. It is great to be back once again, and today we're going to be talking about none other than the Ellis system, which I am doing because none of the other lore makers wanted to touch with a 10-foot pole because, oh my goodness, there are so many planets. There are 13 planets. It's a lot of planets, so we better get started. I'm wasting time right now. We're sitting here on Earth, so let's plan our route straight to the Ellis system by using our amazing handy-dandy star map. Kudos again to Turbulent for developing such a really cool web thing. Uh, let's go to the star in Ellis. Let's see, what are we going to fly today? I'm going to be flying in my F7A Hornet, so let me do a small route. We're going to calculate. We can get there in three jumps. I told you we're in a rush, so let's, let's get there as fast as possible. So we're going right now. We're heading into Davian, and from Davian we're hopping over to Killian. And Killian there, it's a short another hop, and here we are in Ellis. Now I'm going to start scrolling now, and it's going to take me a while to get all the way zoomed out to see all of these wonderful 13 planets. Now the size of the system is 111.936 AU, and I'm going to read that out in kilometers because I had the number, and it's fun. So it is one, oh man, I don't even know where the commas are. Wait, hold on, let me calculate this. Let's see, there's a comma there, and a one there, and another there. All right, so this is, let's see, let's see how many million, 16 billion, 745 million, 387,253.67 kilometers, give or take. Uh, so quite large. Uh, but not really on a galactic scale. We're all meaningless on a galactic scale. Uh, at the center of Ellis is a star named Ellis, and it is an F3V main sequence star. Uh, now, Ellis has quite a large green band, with the inner green band starting at 1.73 AU, and the outer band going all the way out to 2.49. And so this wider green band with a lot of planets in there gave a lot of habitable space which really set the system apart. It was found in 2467 as part of Project Far Star which was a big push by the government at the time to expand humanity's empire out as far as possible so a whole bunch of systems were discovered as part of Project Far Star and almost immediately uh, upon the discovery of Ellis it was very exciting and they dumped a bunch of money into getting it terraformed, some of these inner worlds, and so it's really became best known over the years as being the home of Murray Cup Racing, which got its start here and it's its headquarters currently, so we'll talk about that a bit more later on in this episode of Loremakers, but for right now let's jump over to the innermost world, Ellis One, and you can see here this is a great shot of it because you got those beautiful heat waves going over the planet, which is actually very accurate. Uh, Ellis One is a little tiny planet, just 750 kilometers radius, and it is mostly bubbling hot lava because it is so very close to the star. Uh, there's constant solar flares which are bombarding, bombarding it, and uh, those are also known as coronal mass ejections, which is fun. Um, and, you know, the surface is slowly being burned away and ejected into space as the solar flares hit it. Uh, scans of the world have shown that there are minerals to be harvested there, and unfortunately it is way too dangerous to go in and try to mine those. That hasn't stopped people though, so there have been several horrific accidents related to the attempts to mine Ellis One. Um, you know, the problem has been cracked yet, but maybe one of you out there will figure out a way to mine it. Uh, Ellis 2, let's head over there, right over here. Now, Ellis 2 is a fairly large smog planet, and it's got an extremely dense atmosphere, uh, which is constantly storming, uh, rolling around, and the surface of it is actually a desert world. And so these storms mixed with the desert create these really cool swirling patterns in the, the surface, which are constantly shifting, and it's really beautiful. Um, and they've 
try to actually market that for tourists to come see or with the racing, but the turbulence is such that it's really hard to get down to the surface. You know, if you're a tourist, you don't really want to be rocketed around that much to go see some pretty patterns. So it hasn't exactly taken off. Um, so from there, normally, we would head into the green belt, starting with the planet green, but instead, I'm gonna mix it up, since there's a lot of lore here, we're gonna jump ahead and head to Ellis 6. So let's go there. Now, Ellis 6 is a terrestrial rocky planet. Uh, it sits just outside of the green belt. And this has provided a unique opportunity for the UE to kind of study these worlds that kind of sit on the edge. So there has been a concerted effort over the years to try to make Ellis 6 habitable. Um, and this has been done through UE scientists and a bunch of terraforming uh, corporations have all, like Schumann and Interstellar, have pooled their resources and done studies here. There's a big science station orbiting the world. Oh, you can see it right here. Science station. How about that? And uh, so hopefully they'll be able to use what they've learned here to be able to uh, populate worlds that may be less suitable for habitation down the road. Um, you know, scientists, they get cooped up for a while and they like to party, so there's a good trading to be done here if you got some fun stuff aboard your ship that you're looking to sell. From there, we're going to head out to LS7. Uh, which is located all the way over here. Now, LS7 uh, is another smog planet, our second if you're keeping count at home, and it has rings, which you can see right here. Uh, I love when planets have rings. Uh, it is a highly corrosive atmosphere that's very damaging to ships and anything that you put inside the atmosphere. Uh, and because it's been kind of a natural deterrent from people going to visit there, a lot of outlaws have kind of situated themselves in the area around it. Uh, one, it's a great way to kind of dispose of evidence is by dumping it out into the atmosphere, as well as if, you know, someone's on your trail, you can duck in and you have a few seconds to try to, you know, shake them before your own ship falls apart. Uh, there's rumors that there's some more dangerous type of racing that occurs around here, but those are just rumors. From there, we're going to go out to LS8, all the way over here. Oh, there we go. Go back to... Uh, here we go, we're gonna head now, for real, to LS8. Now, LS8 is a rocky dwarf planet. This is the second smallest planet in the system, the first smallest being Pinecone, which we'll talk about in a bit. And it's got some outposts and mining rigs that are kind of sparsely dotting the surface. Uh, there was a brief trend for a while of uh, racing teams, uh, vying in the Murray Cup, setting up garages over here to have like extreme privacy for what they were doing with their ships. But it's kind of a pain and there's better ways to get uh, privacy. But the kind of trend ebbs and flows over the years. And so maybe it'll come back. Coming here, leaving LS8, we're going to go check out the next planet, which is Walleye. Walleye is a puffy planet, which is a gas giant with a large radius and a very low density, i.e. puffy. It is the largest gas giant in the system. Look at it, look at it, how big and puffy. Uh, it's most known for its gas refineries. It's got a lot of different gas refineries. And they do something kind of interesting here because of all the racing in the system. Uh, the gas refineries here specialize in making individual fuels at the request of the racing teams as well uh, that are ideally suited for racing. Um, so there's a lot of proprietary plants and unique labs. But in general, it's also useful as a stopping point for any of the long haulers moving through the system. Uh, Pinecone, which is the outer world, has a lot of resources, so you get a lot of cross traffic. And so there's a bunch of rest stops in the area of Walleye. It actually earned its name 
uh, from the haulers coming through. There's a large uh, permanent storm on the planet's surface and nicknamed it Walleye. Uh, from there, we go to LS-10, which is known as Bombora. So much scrolling. There we go. This is another gas giant. It's extremely turbulent. It's got a big stormy atmosphere, which is how it earned its name. It's not as well suited for refineries because of that. Um, and so it's got a little less interest going on than its cousin Walleye. From there, we head out to the asteroid belt. Now, this asteroid belt is really well known because it is home to one of the more popular Murray Cup racetracks uh, that skirts through the rocks. Murray Cup, uh, the corporation has been trying to purchase up the rights to prevent mining from happening in the asteroid belt because mining can affect the way uh, asteroids are positioned and stuff like that. So to preserve their really cool racetrack, they've been trying to keep others away from it. Uh, now from there, we're going to head out to Ellis 11, which is over here. Now, Ellis 11 is really cool. Only a few ago, only a few years ago, in 2943, uh, the moon of Alice 11 collided into the planet. Uh, and this was a big deal for scientists to be able to witness this live. They did a whole evacuation of the area because they weren't sure what the effect would be. Um, and they established a science station in the area known as Icarus Station. And or Icarus platform where they were able to study it up close. At the time, there was these rumors going around, maybe Parker Terrell started them, about how this was actually the government doing this on purpose to test a planet-destroying weapon. But the, the evidence points to this being a natural phenomenon. Uh, there was kind of a debate as well between the science uh, organizations and the mining organizations uh, about who would get to use the, the planet after it had collided. Uh, scientists wanted to continue to study the effect of the collision, whereas mining organizations wanted to get in as soon as possible to gain access to all the resources that were released as part of the crash. In the end, mining interests seem to be winning out, and there's a lot of mining going on. Even though with how active geologically it still is from the impact, it's difficult to mine in the area. Uh, astrophysicists speculate that it's going to continue to splinter and may ultimately form a new asteroid belt. So from there, we head out to Judeca, which is over here. It is a terrestrial rocky planet. Uh, it is made out of mostly ice. It's got an ice coating on the whole surface. It's an icy world. Uh, and that's mainly what it's known for being really cold. There's some ice harvesting going on, uh, but not much in other ways. Then from there, we're going out to the last planet in the system, which is Pinecone, which you've heard me mention a few times. Scroll all the way back. For those of you who like slightly off the horizontal orbits, have it right here. Now, uh, this is the outermost planet in the system. It's known locally as Pinecone because of the strange shattered rock surface, which kind of resembles one. You can't really see it in this rendering, but these large tectonic plates kind of lifting off in kind of a way. Uh, it's rich in heavy minerals, and it is a very popular destination for mining in the area. And because of that, it kind of drives traffic into these outer regions for the long haul miners. Um, and a popular thing here for the people who do this run is actually to get pine cone air fresheners, which are shaped like the world. Now that we've hit the outer banks of this system, let's head back into the middle world, into our green band, and talk about our core systems and a little bit more about Murray Cup racing. So the Murray Cup 
dates way back just to when the system was beginning to form, be formed in 2467. They had just discovered it. And all this terraforming was going on. Now, because there wasn't a lot of other infrastructure in the system, uh, the terraformers and their families had to pass the time some way. So they used the, this like extra terraforming equipment that they weren't using and started setting up these racing courses that they would challenge each other to to see how they could skirt around it. Um, and so eventually it just grew and grew from there into this really popular pastime in the system and more and more challenge courses. Now, the name of the system actually came about from the most popular course that they had set up where it was a mnemonic device to help you remember the turns, in which case there was a main L-shaped turn and then a straight narrow way and then an S-shaped turn. So L-I-S, L-S, and that's how it kind of stuck as being referred to as the system as it became more and more popular. Um, now, as, as it grew, eventually people would try to work out in the system and came out here not because they were just happened to be here for the terraforming jobs, but specifically to do the racing. And one gentleman, Amon Murray, uh, who was kind of a smuggler in the area, started running a betting book on the races and his profit from that outweighed anything he was doing from smuggling. So it became his primary focus in the system and he started actually doing a push to make it more legitimate and drive money into it. Um, and so after a few months of running it, uh, he was able to organize the first official Murray Cup race which bore his name. Uh, and that was in 2479, and Ian Rickard was the winner. He was piloting an RSI Nova courier ship, and he had made a ton of personal modifications, which kind of became the standard for Murray Cup racing, that the hull is only where you start, and you have to do a lot of mods to get it up to snuff to compete. Um, and then, uh, so the, the main draw has been for a long time now, the racing and the tourism side of it. Even though it's got a lot of uh, fishing on some of the worlds and um, specifically on campus and also some good mining going on, they've never really developed the manufacturing industry. Even though racing is so popular here, most of the components and everything are made elsewhere and just brought in to be sold in the system. Um, so the first main core system is green, so named because it sits at the edge of the inner green zone line. Um, it was the most recent one to be terraformed and it was constructed as a resort to cater to the racing crowds. Uh, it is an ocean world um, and unfortunately after the terraforming process they have not been able to get sea creatures to survive in the ocean. They haven't been able to figure out quite what went wrong, whether it was something in the terraforming process or something in the water itself. They keep introducing life from neighboring campos or from Earth or other systems and nothing really sticks. They have big blooms, major die-offs, and they're back to where they started. They're still working on it. We'll have to see if it's something that can be solved. Um, the planet is dotted with luxury towers and mega resorts. The main city is Ido, which sits on these stark cliff face overlooking uh, the oceans. Uh, Murray Tower is there, which is the headquarters of the Murray Cup organization, as well as the Murray Cup Racing Museum. Um, and there are atmospheric race courses that dot the world, so you can go sit there and actually watch a race. Um, it's very cool. Next up is Ellis 4 Campos. Uh, so this is a UE represented world like Green also has representation. And this was the first world settled in the system and it remains the most populated planet. Uh, it's much more of a locals planet than Green, which has a lot of tourism. Uh, and one reason for this is that it has a higher than average gravity, uh, which keeps a lot of the architecture very squat and compact and also makes it difficult for visitors to stay there very long until they acclimate to the higher gravity. Um, its oceans are filled with all manners of sea life. Uh, the planet itself is named for a sea creature which was huge named Camposi Magnus, which is now believed to be extinct. Uh, those of you out there who are subscribers may have it as hangar flare, 
a skull of one of these ancient creatures. It's known as the Lords of the Deep, and they were the pinnacle of the food chain on the planet when they roamed the oceans. Um, the high gravity has also given form to the flat cats, which you might have heard about, which uh, are popular pet around the UE, uh, or at least they were while they were in vogue. They're kind of a cat-like creature that has a flatter than average body. Now, the last planet we're going to be talking about today is Noble, or LS5. This world is known for its pristine forests that cover a large portion of the surface. Uh, and in order to protect those uh, forests, the Governor's Council has put a real big focus on sustaining the planet's natural beauty. So when you get there, it's kind of a getting back to nature vibe. The main uh, landing area is Bearton, which they try to direct a lot of traffic there to kind of preserve the forest. Um, and so when you land there, there's a focus there, and you get to the rest of the planet to explore the woods from that main city. And it's kind of cool because of how dark it gets uh, below the tree line when you're like at the base of the trees, a lot of the sun is blocked. So architecture on the world is traditionally higher up, and they build in platforms along the trees or higher towers to get, get some of the sunlight that's coming into the world. Um, and it's not quite as densely populated as neighbors because of this few small towns. So if you're looking to get camping, go camping, Noble is your place to go. Uh, now Noble, you can see here, has two moons allocated to it. Now, um, just because a lot of times we don't mention moons for planets doesn't mean they have them. It's one of those kind of development cycle things that we go through on the narrative side of where we get the broad scope of systems and worlds and the flavor that we need. And from there, we start dialing in more and more as our focus turns to it. So for example, we needed this planet to have the worlds. We need to develop a little bit more about it. So we have the moons uh, identified here, such as Ellis uh, 5a, which uh, is slightly pink thanks to its uh, regolith having that hue. And regolith is kind of the dust covering over the moon. Um, and then we also have LS5b, which is a tidally locked moon. So the planet facing side is pretty pristine while the back side of it uh, is completely pockmarked from impact craters. Um, and so that is Ellis. Other little tidbits is Ellis has a militia known as the Ellis Protection Force. And it also has a satellite team known as the Ellis Racers. So there you go, pretty much a high level view of Ellis. All 13 planets done and accounted for in the weird order that I did them in. Thank you so much uh, for taking the time to listen today and thank you for your comments as well and for helping me understand the difference between Greek and Roman alphabets. It is appreciated and uh, I hope to see you all again soon. Thank you for your support and thank you to the subscribers for making this possible. And that's been Lore Makers. Thank you for watching. So if you want to keep up with the latest and greatest in the Star Citizen and Squadron 42's development, please follow us on our social media channels. See you soon.